A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. Chapter Forty. Three Years Later. When I broke the back of knight errantry that time, I no longer felt obliged to work in secret. So the very next day, I exposed my hidden schools, my mines, and my vast system of clandestine factories and workshops to an astonished world. That is to say, I exposed the nineteenth century to the inspection of the sixth. Well, it is always a good plan to follow up an advantage promptly. The knights were temporarily down, but if I would keep them so, I must just simply paralyze them. Nothing short of that would answer. You see, I was bluffing that last time in the field. It would be natural for them to work around to that conclusion if I gave them a chance, so I must not give them time, and I didn't. I renewed my challenge, engraved it on brass, posted it up where any priest could read it to them, and also kept it standing in the advertising columns of the paper. I not only renewed it, but added to its proportions. I said, name the day, and I would take fifty assistants and stand up against the massed chivalry of the whole earth and destroy it. I was not bluffing this time. I meant what I said. I could do what I promised. There wasn't any way to misunderstand the language of that challenge. Even the dullest of the chivalry perceived that this was a plain case of put up or shut up. They were wise, and did the latter. In all the next three years they gave me no trouble worth mentioning. Consider the three years sped. Now look around on England, a happy and prosperous country, and strangely altered. Schools everywhere, and several colleges, a number of pretty good newspapers. Even authorship was taking a start. Sir Dinadan, the humorist, was first in the field with a volume of gray-headed jokes which I had been familiar with during thirteen centuries. If he had left out that old rancid one about the lecturer, I wouldn't have said anything. But I couldn't stand that one. I suppressed the book and hanged the author. Slavery was dead and gone. All men were equal before the law. Taxation had been equalized. The telegraph, the telephone, the phonograph, the typewriter, the sewing machine, and all the thousand willing and handy servants of steam and electricity were working their way into favor. We had a steamboat or two on the Thames, we had steam warships, and the beginnings of a steam commercial marine. I was getting ready to send out an expedition to discover America. We were building several lines of railway, and our line from Camelot to London was already finished and in operation. I was shrewd enough to make all offices connected with the passenger service places of high and distinguished honor. My idea was to attract the chivalry and nobility, and make them useful, and keep them out of mischief. The plan worked very well. The competition for the places was hot. The conductor of the 433 Express was a duke. There wasn't a passenger conductor on the line below the degree of earl. They were good men, every one. But they had two defects which I couldn't cure, so had to wink at. They wouldn't lay aside their armor, and they would knock down fair, I mean, rob the company. There was hardly a knight in all the land who wasn't in some useful employment. They were going from end to end of the country in all manner of useful missionary capacities. Their penchant for wandering and their experience in it made them altogether the most effective spreaders of civilization we had. They went clothed in steel, and equipped with sword and lance and battle-axe, and if they couldn't persuade a person to try a sewing-machine on the installment plan, or a melodeon, or a barbed-wire fence, or a prohibition journal, or any of the other thousand and one things they canvassed for, they removed him and passed on. I was very happy. Things were working steadily toward a secretly longed-for point. You see, I had two schemes in my head which were the vastest of all my projects. The one was to overthrow the Catholic Church and set up the Protestant faith on its ruins, not as an established church, but a go-as-you-please one. And the other project was to get a decree issued by and by, commanding that upon Arthur's death unlimited suffrage should be introduced, and given to men and women alike, at any rate to all men, wise or unwise, and to all mothers who at middle age should be found to know nearly as much as their sons at twenty-one. Arthur was good for thirty years yet, he being about my own age, that is to say forty, and I believed that in that time I could easily have the active part of the population of that day ready and eager for an event 
which should be the first of its kind in the history of the world a rounded and complete governmental revolution without bloodshed the result to be a republic well i may as well confess though i do feel ashamed when i think of it i was beginning to have a base hankering to be its first president myself yes there was more or less human nature in me i found that out clarence was with me as concerned the revolution but in a modified way his idea was a republic without privileged orders but with a hereditary royal family at the head of it instead of an elective chief magistrate he believed that no nation that had ever known the joy of worshiping a royal family could ever be robbed of it and not fade away and die of melancholy i urged that kings were dangerous he said then have cats he was sure that a royal family of cats would answer every purpose they would be as useful as any other royal family they would know as much they would have the same virtues and the same treacheries the same disposition to get up shindies with other royal cats they would be laughably vain and absurd and never know it they would be wholly inexpensive finally they would have as sound a divine right as any other royal house and tom seventh or tom eleventh or tom fourteenth by the grace of god king would sound as well as it would when applied to the ordinary royal tomcat with tights on and as a rule said he in his neat modern english the character of these cats would be considerably above the character of the average king and this would be an immense moral advantage to the nation for the reason that a nation always models its morals after its monarchs the worship of royalty being founded in unreason these graceful and harmless cats would easily become as sacred as any other royalties and indeed more so because it would presently be noticed that they hanged nobody beheaded nobody imprisoned nobody inflicted no cruelties or injustices of any sort and so must be worthy of a deeper love and reverence than the customary human king and would certainly get it the eyes of the whole harried world would soon be fixed upon this humane and gentle system and the royal butchers would presently begin to disappear their subjects would fill the vacancies with catlings from our own royal house we should become a factory we should supply the thrones of the world within forty years all europe would be governed by cats and we should furnish the cats the reign of universal peace would begin then to end no more for ever me ow fst, wow hang him i supposed he was in earnest and was beginning to be persuaded by him until he exploded that cat howl and startled me almost out of my clothes but he never could be in earnest he didn't know what it was he had pictured a distinct and perfectly rational and feasible improvement upon constitutional monarchy but he was too feather-headed to know it or care anything about it either i was going to give him a scolding but sandy came flying in at that moment wild with terror and so choked with sobs that for a minute she could not get her voice i ran and took her in my arms and lavished caresses upon her and said beseechingly speak darling speak what is it her head fell limp upon my bosom and she gasped almost inaudibly hello central quick i shouted to clarence telephone the king's homeopath to come in two minutes i was kneeling by the child's crib and sandy was dispatching servants here there and everywhere all over the palace i took in the situation almost at a glance membranous croup i bent down and whispered wake up sweetheart hello central she opened her soft eyes languidly and made out to say papa that was a comfort she was far from dead yet i sent for preparations of sulphur i rousted out the croup kettle myself for i don't sit down and wait for doctors when sandy or the child is sick i knew how to nurse both of them and had had experience this little chap had lived in my arms a good part of its small life and often i could soothe away its troubles and get it to laugh through the tear-dews on its eyelashes when even its mother couldn't sir lancelot in his richest armor came striding along the great hall now on his way to the stock board he was president of the stock board and occupied the siege perilous which he had bought of sir galahad for the stock board consisted of the knights of the round table and they used the round table for business purposes now seats at it were worth well you would never believe the figure so it is no use to state it sir lancelot was a bear and he had put up a corner in one of the new lines and was just getting ready to squeeze the shorts to-day but what of that 
he was the same old Lancelot, and when he glanced in as he was passing the door and found out that his pet was sick, that was enough for him. Bulls and bears might fight it out their own way for all of him. He would come right in here and stand by little Hello Central for all he was worth. And that was what he did. He shied his helmet into the corner, and in half a minute he had a new wick in the alcohol lamp and was firing up the croup kettle. By this time Sandy had built a blanket canopy over the crib, and everything was ready. Sir Lancelot got up steam. He and I loaded up the kettle with unslaked lime and carbolic acid, with a touch of lactic acid added thereto, then filled the thing up with water, and inserted the steam-pout under the canopy. Everything was ship now, and we sat down on either side of the crib to stand our watch. Sandy was so grateful and so comforted that she charged a couple of churchwardens with willow-bark and sumac tobacco for us, and told us to smoke as much as we pleased. It couldn't get under the canopy, and she was used to smoke, being the first lady in the land who had ever seen a cloud blown. Well, there couldn't be a more contented or comfortable sight than Sir Lancelot in his noble armor, sitting in gracious serenity at the end of a yard of snowy churchwarden. He was a beautiful man, a lovely man, and was just intended to make a wife and children happy. But, of course, Guinevere— However, it's no use to cry over what's done and can't be helped. Well, he stood watch and watch with me, right straight through for three days and nights, till the child was out of danger. Then he took her up in his great arms and kissed her, with his plumes falling about her golden head, then laid her softly in Sandy's lap again, and took his stately way down the vast hall between the ranks of admiring men-at-arms and menials, and so disappeared. And no instinct warned me that I should never look upon him again in this world. Lord, what a world of heartbreak it is! The doctors said we must take the child away if we would coax her back to health and strength again, and she must have sea air. So we took a man-of-war and a suite of two hundred and sixty persons, and went cruising about, and after a fortnight of this we stepped ashore on the French coast, and the doctors thought it would be a good idea to make something of a stay there. The little king of that region offered us his hospitalities, and we were glad to accept. If we had had as many conveniences as he lacked, we should have been plenty comfortable enough. Even as it was, we made out very well in his queer old castle, by the help of comforts and luxuries from the ship. At the end of a month I sent the vessel home for fresh supplies and for news. We expected her back in three or four days. She would bring me, along with other news, the result of a certain experiment which I had been starting. It was a project of mine to replace the tournament with something which might furnish an escape for the extra steam of the chivalry, keep those bucks entertained and out of mischief, and at the same time preserve the best thing in them, which was their hardy spirit of emulation. I had had a choice band of them in private training for some time, and the date was now arriving for their first public effort. This experiment was baseball. In order to give the thing vogue from the start, and place it out of the reach of criticism, I chose my nines by rank, not capacity. There wasn't a knight in either team who wasn't a sceptered sovereign. As for material of this sort, there was a glut of it always around Arthur. You couldn't throw a brick in any direction and not cripple a king. Of course, I couldn't get these people to leave off their armor. They wouldn't do that when they bathed. They consented to differentiate the armor so that a body could tell one team from the other, but that was the most they would do. So one of the teams wore chain-mail ulsters, and the other wore plate-armor made of my new Bessemer steel. Their practice in the field was the most fantastic thing I ever saw. Being ball-proof, they never skipped out of the way, but stood still and took the result. When a Bessemer was at the bat and a ball hit him, it would bound a hundred and fifty yards sometimes. And when a man was running and threw himself on his stomach to slide to his base, it was like an iron-clad coming into port. At first I appointed men of no rank to act as umpires, but I had to discontinue that. These people were no easier to please than other nines. The umpire's first decision was usually his last. They broke him in two with a bat, and his friends toted him home on a shutter. When it was noticed that no umpire ever survived a game, umpiring got to be unpopular. So I was obliged to appoint somebody whose rank and lofty position under the government would protect him. Here are the names of the nines. Bessemers, King Arthur, King Lot of Lothian, King of Northgallus, King Marsil, King of Little Britain, King Labor, 
King Pelham of Lysengees, King Bagdemagus, King Ptolemy La Paintus, Ulsters, Emperor Lucius, King Logris, King Martel of Ireland, King Morganor, King Mark of Cornwall, King Nentris of Garlot, King Melodius of Lyonnes, King of the Lake, the Sowden of Syria. Umpire? Clarence. The first public game would certainly draw fifty thousand people, and for solid fun would be worth going round the world to see. Everything would be favorable. It was balmy and beautiful spring weather now, and nature was all tailored out in her new clothes. End of chapter 40